Okay. Um, hello, my name is George Kubis, and I'll be presenting with Tony Massaro on gas permeation. So now to go into what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to get a little bit of introduction, then move to a theory in the apparatus. From there, we'll go to the procedure results, uh, conclusion, and then a few recommendations and some safety factors when uh, performing this lab. So. First to start off is membranes are used a lot in industry, so it's important to know the permeability of uh, the specific membrane in use because that will depend on what membrane you want to use for uh, what flux through the membrane. Uh, permeability is a directly related to in, or inversely related to the pressure gradient and directly um, proportional to the max flux through the membrane. So. Uh, now a little theory. The solute, which for us was oxygen, first dissolves through the uh, high pressure uh, gas film side. From there, it um, dissolves into the membrane, which for use in this membrane, for our membrane was the dense polymer membrane at a thickness of uh, 0.004 inches. Uh, from there, it reaches equilibrium as it diffuses through the membrane and then finally diffuses out the low uh, gas side film, low pressure gas side film. So right here is a picture of uh, what is exactly happening. Um, it's important to note that uh, PA1 is uh, the pressure uh, of the atmosphere, or the surrounding is equal to the pressure at the interface and that's because we assume the resistances are zero of the two gas side films. So you can see the uh, Right there, and then our flux equation was the flux is equal to the permeability over the thickness of the membrane times the pressure gradient. And here's our apparatus. You have uh, an oxygen nitrogen mixture flowing into the top cavity, while you have pure nitrogen flowing into the bottom cavity. Uh, there's a membrane that separates in between, and some oxygen diffuses across the membrane and will flow out with the nitrogen on the bottom cavity. So for our procedure, first we did um, our first started off doing a 30 on scale nitrogen on the bottom and a 90 on scale nitrogen on the top. That was our flow uh, readings, which we'll talk about um, changing those to actual uh, flow rates later. And we had to check that the concentrations were approximately zero for oxygen in coming from the top and bottom cavity. Next, we opened the oxygen to 10 on scale on the top while moving the nitrogen down to 80 and we left the bottom constant uh, the whole time and then we recorded the concentrations and noted average values at the equilibrium that we then corresponded later with our graphs. Now we repeated this for two different concentrations flowing in the top. Uh, it was a 30, 30 on scale oxygen, 60 on scale nitrogen, and 50-50. Uh, so then here's our results. As you can see, we have at the beginning when I was talking about pure nitrogen flowing in. Um, this is the top chamber, which was recorded in weight percent. And we have about a zero weight percent of O2. And then as we increase uh, to 10 on scale, 30 on scale, and thus 50 on scale, you can see we have increases in the weight percent of oxygen in the stream coming out the, uh, um, in the top. And then finally, here's our bottom chamber. Um, it's roughly zero. This was about what we had for, that's our baseline, which later in our calculations, we do subtract the baseline, thus making it zero. So we only care about the actual differences and change between the two levels. So we have, uh, again, no flow of oxygen through the top. And then we bump, and then once the flow of oxygen was started, you can see the increase, and thus the diffusion of oxygen across the membrane, thus giving us a parts per million in the bottom chamber. And now I'm going to pass it over to Tony to explain to us. Okay, so in order to actually get the volumetric and the mass flow rate, we had to go from the rotunda, which was calibrated for air at 7 degrees Fahrenheit and 0 PSIG. But since we weren't flowing air through, we were flowing pure oxygen or pure nitrogen through it, we have to calibrate accordingly. This is just the graph of how it was calibrated for air, the scale reading corresponding to that, the volumetric flow rate. And so, because of that, uh, luckily enough, our uh, base conditions for temperature and our base conditions for pressure were the same as what we were operating at. So basically the only calculation, the 
the only thing that varied or caused it to change was the specific gravity, and it's proportional to, in fact, the square root of the specific gravity of the substance over the calibrated specific gravity, which is one since we get in the air. So basically, it all boils down to times the square root of the specific gravity of the substance. Um, as we can see, since we're dealing with nitrogen, the specific gravity is less than one. So when we go from an example flow rate of 146, which it was red, the actual flow rate was uh, lower than that, 146 to 141, because it's a lesser, less dense substance. But uh, when we have oxygen flowing through, again, same base conditions, temperature and pressure, we have a higher specific gravity, so the actual flow rate is higher than the calibrated or red flow rate in this case. Okay, so we can now find the, we know the volume percent, because again, as George pointed out, we have those graphs of the volumetric percent, which we got from the voltages, calibrated or the linear graph and all that. And so we can find the partial pressure on both sides of the membrane, because in the overall equation, we need the partial pressures before and after the membrane. So we have 76 centimeters of mercury, which is our atmosphere, which is, as before, what we were operating at, but with one of them, the centimeters of mercury to deal with the units we're dealing with, uh, times the volumetric percent over 100 in the top one, because that's what we were dealing with, and in parts per million on the bottom. This is just to get in volumetric percent, and that's volumetric percent as well. Um, this basically stems from the partial pressure is the total pressure, the one atmosphere, times the mass percent of, in both cases. And we can do a volumetric percent based on basically an ideal gas, since the total pressure, the gas constant, the temperature are all the same. It just boils down to volumetric percent is mass percent in this case. Okay, so then we can calculate the amount of oxygen actually permeated through. We measured the, we knew the volumetric flow rate of nitrogen uh, through it. And we have the molar volume at STP. That gives us a mass uh, over there. And this is the amount of oxygen flowing through over the amount of nitrogen, since 10 to the 6 in parts per million is the total. If you subtract the oxygen, you've got nitrogen. So that cancels out, leaving us with um, oxygen, mass flowing through. And then we subtract the baseline, as George pointed out before. So the flux of O2, then, is the amount of mass that went through over the area of the membrane. And then we arrange it from the previous equation, you get the permeability constant. Okay, here's just this uh, tabulated value. It's actually kind of cluttered, I apologize for that. Um, there's our parts per million and our weight percent, which is just the values from the equilibrium of the graph. Nothing new there. Um, the calculated fluxes for each of them, and then the permeability over the length and the permeability. Uh, as you can see, they're all relatively constant. In centimeters cubed at STP times centimeters over centimeters times centimeters of mercury. Uh, actually, I, we messed up. This should be 50 times 10 to the ninth, since that's a bar, I believe it is. And 5 e to the eighth is essentially 50 e to the ninth. So they're all pretty much constant, and they match pretty closely to the literature values. Uh, in conclusion, then, uh, they agree with the literature values as such. Um, when we vary the oxygen flow rate over the three trials, it didn't affect the permeability, the PM, which is good because that's a constant of the membrane, so it shouldn't be varying. And um, that's pretty much it for that. Uh, safety concerns. Uh, we were dealing with uh, pressurized tanks of oxygen and nitrogen, and as such, they should be labeled, and you should know what you're working with, the hazards, what they are, essentially. Um, they should be contained firmly and not allowed to be loose and fall and rupture because bad things happen then. Uh, similarly, as you don't want it hitting things, you don't want to be heating it up, and you don't want to be putting flames near it because explosions can occur, and projectiles are launched, toxic gases, etc. Uh, when you're moving them, you should take proper concerns, such as putting on the valve caps, using gloves if you need to, or whatnot, and uh, open it slowly so it doesn't basically get out of control and explode, etc. Uh, recommendations. Uh, we we thought that we could. Since we only had time for one week, we only used one membrane, but we could have used like another trial with a different thickness membrane to basically test that theory. A, if there's like an effective thickness to the membrane, if all of it is actually used for permeability, and B, whether or not there is indeed zero resistance between uh, the film of the membrane and the gas itself. And secondly, we contemplated whether or not it would make sense to add an intermediary chamber 
analogous to the bottom chamber, we know what's flowing in, we'd have the readings of it. And so that way we could do one, uh, one membrane of one thickness and then a membrane of the same thickness. So we could test, it's, it's just a way of, it would be a quicker, easier way of running a data sample on part of the membrane then switching it out for another part of the same membrane of the same thickness, just to test if the overall membrane is consistent throughout the entire block of membrane we've been given, per se, backward. Uh, and our uh, references for our transport book at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee <laughs> on safety. Any questions? <laughs>